Okay, welcome everybody to uh, uh, Jane Irrigation's uh, virtual lunch and learn. Uh, I'm Richard Restucia, um, uh, Vice President of Water Management Solutions for Jane. And uh, due to uh, COVID uh, and wanting to connect with uh, customers and make sure that we still kept this momentum for water conservation moving forward in spite of everything that's going on. We're been offering a series of our lunch and learns and, uh, and today we're gonna to be talking about the components of drip irrigation. I'm really excited about that. Before though we get started, I just wanted to mention, you know, I did a podcast yesterday with uh, Brian Horn and Chris Sabarisi, Brian Horn from Lawn and Landscape and Chris Sabarisi from Corona Tools. And uh, we talked about a survey that Lawn and Landscape did with uh, contractors across the US. And uh, in general, you know, the idea was how is business? Are things slowing down? Is this impacting your business in a dramatic way? And I just wanted to let everybody know that, uh, you know, three weeks ago when they first did the survey, uh, people said it was slowing down maybe about as much as 30%. Uh, last week's survey was about 15% better than uh, what they saw a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I will also let you know that uh, I did check in with uh, quite a few uh, landscape architects that I know. And uh, I mentioned the landscape architects because they're really, you know, working on business four, six, uh, eight months out. And the ones I talked to said they had a couple people maybe slow down projects, but uh, then after a week or so, they came back on. So. The good news for all of us is that uh, business, uh, in spite of what's going on, and you know we, we do have uh, uh, a lot of compassion and care for the people that are being impacted, uh, and, and we have to feel very fortunate that uh, we're not impacted as much, uh, uh, and, and that things uh, seem to be moving forward in a good way. So just wanted to bring that news to all of you, uh, since I know you're in the business and interested. Um, Today, we're really lucky. Uh, our presenter uh, is Michael Derwenko. Uh, Michael's been at Jane Irrigation now for about uh, a little over five years. Uh, Jay, uh, prior to that, and, and Michael's got a really great experience in irrigation. He's been an irrigation contractor. He worked for an irrigation contractor, Valley Crest. He's also worked for uh, some large uh, manufacturers as well as Jane. He's got um, great marketing skills as well as actual uh, field skills. It's a, uh, it's a real combination that you don't see uh, very often. I'm sure some of you have seen some of the uh, blog articles he's written about water conservation or about drip irrigation, as well as uh, knowing him from all the great photos that uh, he takes uh, for the industry. So uh, I guess we're really lucky to have an uh, expert with this type of experience talking to us today about the components of drip irrigation. And with that, um, I, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. And I just wanna mention that uh, I do have everybody muted right now. And uh, as you have questions, if you'll just type your questions into the uh, chat box, and then uh, I'll be at appropriate times asking uh, Michael those questions, whether it's during the presentation or after. But uh, please use that uh, Zoom group chat and you'll find it at the bottom of your screen. Uh, for those questions, and uh, and we'll be uh, getting all those uh, answered today as well. So, uh, thanks very much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Michael, thank you, Richard. Before I begin, you got good audio. You can hear me, okay? Just great. Yeah, sounds excellent. All right, thank you guys. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Um, hopefully, we can dispel some of the uh, the common myths of your of drip irrigation today. I know uh, when I started years ago, I wasn't a huge fan of drip irrigation, but I've quickly learned that you know when installed properly with the right products and you know, right processes and procedures. It, it can last a long time with very little maintenance. Um, and we all know that it is, you know, the most efficient way to water and irrigate anything from row crops to, uh, to landscaping and drought tolerant plants. So uh, I want to cover some of the basics, some stuff a little more complex today. Um, but more than anything, you know, if you do have questions, please let Richard know and we'll address them at the end. Um, these are some of the topics that we're going to cover today. Um, you know, we're going to start off with the application of drip irrigation. When are we using drip irrigation? Uh, we'll go into the individual components of the systems and then cover some of the, you know, in, in the 20 years that I've been doing drip, working with drip irrigation, I've got a lot of questions, a, a lot of clarification needed on different products and how to install things properly. Um, so these are some of the topics that uh, I think if we address, um, you know, it'll point everybody in the right direction. 
Um, firstly, uh, hold on, let me get rid of these camera tiles, Richard, sorry. All right. Uh, so firstly, the applications of drip irrigation. Uh, as a lot of you know, uh, you know, when mulch moves or ground cover moves, it exposes the drip irrigation of the emitter line, uh, you know, and then that's usually when we find out about our issues. Uh, but when installed properly, it should be beneath ground cover. We never see it where the plants thrive and they get the water straight to the root base with the, uh, you know, the highest accuracy of any emission device in irrigation. So uh, I've put a couple photos in here to show, you know, these are some popular uh, applications for drip irrigation. In Southern California, where we're at, we use a lot of emitter line and point source emission for drought tolerant landscapes with substantial plant spacings. Uh, our tree rings, especially new trees, uh, you know, could use a couple rings of emitter line around them uh, to make sure that they're getting water straight to the base and we're not getting runoff or we're not using flood bubblers where, the, you know, the tree's drinking out of a fire hose and it's getting a lot of water too quickly. Um, especially with harder soils um, like we have on the West Coast. Uh, we also, you know, the, the government is, uh, the state of California, along with a lot of governments across the country, are offering rebates for a good reason. Uh, you know, if you eliminate a lot of your turf areas that are unnecessary, uh, you know, we can reduce water substantially. And so, uh, if in doing so, when we switch over to a lot of drought tolerant uh, pallets, we can cut the water usage in half. Um, and this is why the government is, uh, is giving us money back for turf conversions and for putting low use plants in. Um, some, other, some other applications, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, when I talk to them on projects, they're under the impression that they have to either be using a midter line or supply tubing. Uh, the beauty of a lot of drip irrigation products now is, uh, you know, they're pressure compensated, pressure regulated. Uh, and so everything should be getting the right amount of water. And if that's the case, working within our flow dynamics by station or hydro zone, uh, we should be able to switch back and forth from supply tubing and point source emitters to emitter line. And I'll talk specifically about what each of these applications is in a second. But as you can see in the top left photo or top right photo with the power lock, um, we can easily convert from a supply tubing line to an emitter line and irrigate ground cover and drought tolerant landscapes in the same station uh, usually reducing the water window and obviously reducing a huge amount of the water use. Uh, in tight spaces, we use smaller quarter inch emitter. Uh, mini pep line is what we call it. It's a, it's a smaller emitter line, but it ultimately serves the same purpose. We're distributing water to the root base uh, and we're not allowing for you know, a lot of runoff and wasteful water. Uh, we are supply tubing to move under hardscapes. Um, maybe we don't need irrigation in between. It reduces weeds when you're not watering areas in between plants where you don't need it. And so we're trying to water only what we need to water, thus reducing maintenance. Um, another more popular uh, use for irrigation, uh, subsurface, excuse me, drip irrigation these days is subsurface turf irrigation. This is an application up in the Fresno Central Valley where, uh, you know, not only is water a scarcity, but you get fined for wasting water. Um, and not to mention, you're, you're just simply wasting water that you don't need to waste because your, you know, your D rate or your distribution uniformity of your emission device is what it needs to be. So in this application, you know, we've done 12 inch spacing um, with our laterals and 12 inch emitter, emitter spacing. And as this, uh, you know, you see these little crop circles, uh, as the, the system runs, the system was probably only running for about three or four minutes right here. Uh, after 10 minutes, that whole ground is completely saturated, and that's only within 10 to 15 minutes. So you can imagine when installed properly with a good uh, layer of fertile soil on top of the emitter line, uh, you would only need to water for 30 to 45 minutes a few times a week, and because all your water is going directly to the root base. In an application like this, what we call in the irrigation industry is our DU rate, or distribution uniformity. That's how we measure the accuracy of our irrigation. And in subsurface turf irrigation, you're well above 90 to 92% water going directly to the root base where you want it. And as you can see in the turf, uh, you get a very nice solid coat of, of grass uh, that isn't you know, get, it's susceptible to multiple fungus as you get from a lot of the overhead water. All right, the components. Um, a lot of the seasoned veterans out there, seasoned contractors, you're gonna know a lot of these components. They're, they're very typical in what we you know, what we're doing every day. Um, but if you don't know, um, you know, the system starts with automation. Uh, it, it's the best to install a drip system than have to go out and turn a faucet on or turn a ball valve on every time you need it. Part of the formula, the magic formula to drip irrigation is the consistency and the intervals. Just like we want to eat three, meal, three square meals a day, so do our landscapes and our turf um, or our agricultural products, as the guys know. 
Um, and so what we want to do is we want to put an automatic control valve on there. This is going to help control our hydraulics. Very similar to your house, if you turn on every faucet and every shower head in your house, eventually you're going to lose pressure across the board because the city only provides you with a certain amount of water pressure. And the same is true with irrigation. This is why our irrigation systems typically run at night, not just because that's when we get the most out of our water saturation, but because we don't want to compromise water pressure inside our house to water our yards. Um, so that being said, what a control valve is going to do is it's going to allow you to break up different zones, just like a faucet or a shower would. Uh, so you get that consistency and pressure around the um, around the system, and that's what an automatic control valve is going to do. We refer to these valves, this black one that you see, it's got a little solenoid on top. That's what actually receives the low voltage signal from a controller and allows it to come on and off. The flow control knob on top of the valve is not made to shut off the valve. It's simply made for closing speed. That's another popular question we get is, what is the flow control knob on top of a valve for? Uh, typically what I do when I install these valves is I'll open them up all the way. I'll test it to close it. If it takes longer than uh, you know, 20 seconds to close, then I know the distance between the bottom of the diaphragm internally and the bottom of the valve is too big and it's taking too long to close. And so what we do is we lessen that space by tightening the flow control and thus lowering the atmospheric pressure inside the valve and that allows the valve to shut down faster. So if your valves in your yard, um, you think they're clogged or they're stuck open too long, sometimes just uh, messing with the flow control can, can change that internal distance and get them to close a little quicker. Um, it also is going to allow you to manually check it with the little solenoid uh, uh, manual on off switch and ultimately connect it to a controller hopefully that you know is going to add some consistency to your schedule. Uh, filtration is huge. Obviously at Jane we, we do anything from giant agricultural products to landscape products so uh, you know we really consider ourselves uh, specialists when it comes to filtration. Um, so we want to put a primary filtration method on a system at the beginning, uh, whether or not be giant media filter tanks that we use on ag uh, or steel filters, all the way down to three quarter and one inch uh, spin clean filters like you see here. This is a standard Y filter. It's a mesh steel. It's got a steel mesh inside of it that can be maintenance or cleaned um, along with a flush cap to, uh, to allow the system to be flushed upon installation. Um, I personally uh, like and unions on all my filters and all my valves if possible for future maintenance it's way easier to take a valve out of a manifold uh, with a union than it is to cut it out um, so anything you can do proactively if you're the guy that's installing the system and the guy that's gonna have to maintenance the system whether or not be the drip aspect or the primary functions of the system the filtration and the valves and the controller I always like to do a really good job because if I'm the guy maintenance it makes my job a lot easier down the road and I think one of the huge uh, challenges we've had in drip irrigation is people usually like to just install it and think that they're never gonna see the system again. And very quickly they learn that when they come back to the site, they're gonna have issues that they can't maintenance easily, thus the frustration. And the, that's why we try to go over some of these proper procedures and try to eliminate that. Um, some of the other popular components are, is obviously tubing. This is our emission device in this case. This is how we are applying water. Supply tubing with the combination, which supply tubing is just to be blank tubing with no holes in it. Um, and then we're gonna pluck little button emitters or point source emitters into them. And that's where our water is gonna be distributed out of. And we can put those wherever we want them, depending on our plant spacing. Emitter line is gonna have more consistent spacing, more consistent flow. You're gonna typically, and we'll go over this in a second, 12 inch, 24 inch, uh, 18 inch spacing, where the emitters basically come in a, a predisposed distance with a predisposed flow. And it's up to the installer to just make sure that they don't install too much drip line, just like the metaphor I used with the shower and the faucet. If you install too many emitters or too many feet of emitter line, you're gonna run out of pressure and flow. And the one on the end of the line isn't gonna have the, as much as the one at the beginning of the line. And that can be an issue. We want consistent water coverage across the board, which is why we'll talk about in a second pressure compensation and regulation, which is, is gonna help with that. Anytime we can reduce variables in a system or a design, it's gonna add consistency, which makes maintenance and way easier. And lastly, Michael, fittings. Was, sorry. Michael, we had a quick question. Uh, I think it's appropriate to, to ask right now, and that is, uh, you were showing some photos of uh, subsurface drip for turf. And uh, a question was, how deep do you bury the, uh, the emitter line in this type of situation? So um, obviously I can't give a, across the board four inches all the time um, because a lot of people, uh, you know, they'll either use a thatching machine or they're doing some, um, of, uh, some sort of uh, 
I'm sorry, what's the term with the, <laughs> the where they poke into the ground and allow air to, to release? Aerators. Yeah. So, um, so, and then on golf courses, they'll use it around tee boxes a lot and around uh, greens. And so anytime you're using heavy machinery, you want to be careful. Typically, I say four to six inches. It still, it still does require um, some either hand watering or a lot of people will leave a couple, a zone of sprinklers on and then convert the rest of the transmitter line. That way they can overhead water to get things established uh, because the grass, the roots, you know, when it comes to sod or seed, you're going to need to produce some water overhead to get it growing. But ultimately about four to six inches is as deep as the, uh, the emitter line needs to be. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. And that's, that's how deep it was in this application. Uh, in this image where you see the little, uh, the little emitter circles, uh, we were yet to put down the fertile soil, as you can see in the curbing surrounding it. So we were about to probably add a few inches of soil here um, on top. And then by the time you put the sod on top, you're about four to six inches, which is gonna protect a lot of the water from escaping. All right. Um, pressure regulation, as I mentioned, we, want, we really want consistency. This makes scheduling a lot easier. Um, you know, our controllers read minutes. Uh, you know, we set them up for minutes and hours at a time. But if you don't have any consistency uh, behind how much water you're applying at a minute or an hourly basis, it becomes a guessing game. And traditionally, people what they'll do is they'll just crank up the time, apply more water, and in doing so, it usually creates more harm than good. And so what we want to do is we want to try to eliminate as many variables as possible when we're designing a drip irrigation system. One of those things we use is a pressure regulator. In this case, you've probably seen them on the secondary side of your zone valves and valve boxes all around your yard. And what it does is it's making sure that regardless of the pressure that's coming in from the city, that we're always at a static, um, or excuse me, uh, a dynamic 30, 20 PSI, 30 PSI, where the system is never seeing 60 to 80 pounds of pressure. It just doesn't need that. No irrigation system needs that. Even golf rotors very rarely need over 60 PSI. So uh, the idea that more pressure means more water and more heads is just not the case. Uh, if anything, we want to try to design a little bit backwards where everything is within its, all the products are within their operating range and they're within the flow ranges they need to be apply water consistently. And that's going to make our scheduling that much easier. So in this case, I've put a, uh, a just a simple uh, a screw on regulator that can go on the bottom of a head or a, a nozzle and an inline pressure regulator, which would go on the backside of your valve or at the beginning of a drip system to make sure that you know, you're getting the right amount of flow and uh, pressure to the, to the emitter line. Right below that is some air vents and flush valves. And what these are gonna do is, uh, if you've ever heard your emitter line early in the morning whistling, uh, traditionally what that is, is that's actually, um, you know, and along with Jane, most manufacturers design their emitters uh, to flush debris through themselves with water. Uh, and so if you have water with debris in it, you're not going to get a clogged emitter. What traditionally happens is you get uh, this turbulence when the system first comes on and uh, the, the air blows into the line. And that is when the debris is in there that clogs the emitters and holds them open. And that's when you get the whistling. So to eliminate that, what we're going to do is we put a, either an air vent on a larger system or a flush valve on the end of each row. Um, the ag guys install, you know, six, or six, you know, 600 to 1,000 feet of tape. You, you can't afford to have half your line get clogged. So they'll put a flush valve on the end. So every time the system comes on, it's going to blow all the debris out, blow the air out, eliminate that potential for turbulent air turbulence. And that way, any debris that it goes into the line, either from back flushing or from maintenance that might have occurred, is going to get flushed out of the lines the next time the system runs. And we're going to, you know, hopefully eliminate a lot of that risk. Um, and then lastly, you know, emission devices, when we're not using inline emitter, uh, emitter line, we, we've got to tell the water where to go manually. And this is what we'll use. We'll use what I've pictured here is just a point source emitter. It's a very standard barbed emitter. Um, uh, ours is a dirty, dirty water emitter because we use it in ag and landscape. So it does a really good job of uh, not let, allowing itself to be clogged when it's buried. Um, and then the, our popular octobubbler, it's an A-port manifold, pressure compensating manifolds. You know, if you can get, if you can give an octobubble the right amount of water and the right amount of pressure, all eight ports are going to get exactly the amount, um, plants are going to get the exact amount of water off of each port that you want. Uh, you know, I will, I will say that uh, the majority of support questions that we get about octobubbler is, uh, revolves around not operating in the right pressure ranges and the right flow ranges. Uh, most people tell me, well, I'm getting more water out of one port than another, or it's not shutting down. I will tell you that simple physics of this device uh, 
most of the time when that stuff happens, it's because your system dynamics are just not within the operating range and flow range of the device. And it's going to lead to these inconsistencies. And more often than not, um, you're going to send me the Octorella back. I'm going to test it. I'm going to send it back to you and tell you that we need to work on the design dynamics of your system. And then I also wanted to include, I know we're mostly talking about landscape here, but uh, you know, tape, uh, I learned a, a while back about tape because we are an agriculture business as well. Uh, tape is a little bit different. Uh, a lot of times they won't use a physical emitter. The tape itself has an embedded emitter stream inside of it, uh, an emitter flow path, as you can see here. Uh, and our Chapin tape is, is a very, very high-end tape that we use that uh, does a really good job of filtering and flushing itself by the tens of thousands of feet. And it's used in large-scale farming. And you know, we're trying to, trying to slowly convert anybody that's using overhead or pivot over to drip irrigation uh, through the use of tape. Um, application rates uh, are read a little bit differently from one to the other, as I've had to learn myself. Uh, you know, because we're running so many feet of tape, uh, we often will measure it in gallons per minute per 100 feet. It's, it's an easier way to kind of comprehend the amount of water use and the, the amount of hydraulic demand that's going to exist on a system when using tape. Whereas on the emitter line side in landscape, we use gallons per hours. Um, because we're typically watering anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, we've also done that because most controllers, as we know, uh, operate in minutes and in hours. Um, another popular question we get is um, pressure compensation versus pressure regulation. Uh, a, a lot of people don't, what this, don't know what this term is. I can't tell you how many sites I've rolled out to and seen 2,000 feet of emitter line on, and the complaint is I don't have enough water. Um, that's typically not an emitter line issue. That is a, uh, that's a static pressure issue. Your, your system has a certain amount of static pressure, pressure that it has on the, the primary side of itself uh, without anything running. And then we have a dynamic pressure that's going to run uh, as you know, your actual emission devices are producing water. And what we, one of the huge confusions we have is that we have a pressure compensation device that's gonna, you know, depending on the flow that you give this little click to for this little button emitter, he's gonna make sure that the same amount of water comes out. However, if you give him 80 or 90 PSI pounds of pressure, he's gonna really struggle. It's just a simple, it's just a, the, once again, the simple physics of a, of a little plate inside there that's slowing the water down. And if you give it too much pressure, you're gonna have issues and inconsistencies. But to stay away from that. So if you're regulating at a system level and you're compensating at an emission level, if you can check those two boxes, more often than not, you're going to have a, a really good drip system. The regulation side, like we see, um, that's not only important for drip irrigation, but also pop-ups, rotors, anything else that need a certain amount of operating pressure, this is going to help us control that. If we combine our regulation pressure at the beginning of our system or the beginning of our zone with proper zone dynamics or you know, not putting too many heads on a zone or too many emitters on his own, we should once again get the exact consistent application rates that we're looking for. Any questions about compensation or regulation, Richard? I'm surprised if I can make it past this slide with no questions. Yeah, um, so nothing yet, but uh, I'll, I'll, I will definitely keep you posted. All right, great. Um, so another popular question that I've been getting for many years when helping with design is how many heads, how much emitter line, how many emitters can I put on a zone? Um, and as much as I just like to tell everybody 10 and they quickly come back and say 10 what? And it's like, well, that's exactly my point is there's a lot of here on your site that I'm completely unaware of. So one of the major vari variables that people forget is we can tell you as a manufacturer how much, you know, water our emitter is going to put out or how much our octobubbler or even, you know, our pop-up spray or someone's rotor. We can tell you how much it's going to put out within that operating range. But one thing that you're going to have to factor into your design is how much you know, how much energy is being eaten up by the friction inside your tubing, inside your PVC, um, all these things. If you have heads 100 feet apart, uh, it, would be, it would be naive to think that you're going to have the exact same amount of water and pressure from the first head to the last head. That's just not the case. We are going to lose some of that with the friction inside PVC, the friction inside polyethylene tubing, any tubing we're using. And so uh, even with four feet, even an elbow, T, any of these fittings add some turbulence to the system and they eat up some of the energy and the water we need that we're trying to redirect to the, to the emission devices we're using. And so believe it or not, science has created these great friction loss charts for every size pipe and for every distance you can think of. I've provided one here as an example with some tips that I give people when they're sizing their POC or their reservoir or their valves or their filtration. Um, and it, as you see, you go up to two inches, you're quickly losing at, at 70 gallons per minute, you're quickly losing almost, you know, 10 pounds of 
pressure. And so that can, it can be eaten up really quick. So you want to take that into account when you're also reviewing the demand of your emission devices. You want to take into account how big your zone is. Um, and then this is one of the reasons why if you know you're at a, at a constant 40 PSI with a regulator, it makes reading and referencing all these charts that much easier. Uh, hydro zoning, um, you've heard the term zones. Uh, a very popular question is what's the difference between a zone and a station? Guess what? Nothing. A station is what we call a zone on a controller. On a controller, years ago, a manufacturer said people are com confused by a hydro zone. Let's call them a station. So when you see a station on your controller, more often than not, it's connected to a station or zone valve that has been zoned out because all the plants on that particular zone require a certain amount of water. We call it hydro zoning. In this illustration here, you'll see all the trees are on their own zone, the garden's on its own zone, the turf's on its own zone, because we know that the, the, distant, the time that that schedule or that zone runtime needs to run is different than these other ones. We know exactly how much water is leaving that zone because we've controlled it with our emission devices. Now we need to know how long to water for to get the right amount of water out. We do that with the process of zone. Also our system hydraulics, going back to the faucet and the sink metaphor, you can't run everything at once. You couldn't run this whole landscape at one time. The water provider, your utility provider is just not going to provide enough water for you. We have these great illustrations online if you want to part out a system. Um, we talked for three hours about tubing. I know Richard would be excited about that. I, I, I've learned a lot about tubing in, in the years I've been at Jane. Um, I think it is not apples to apples when we talk about tubing. There's, a, there's definitely a high quality of tubing, just like there's a high quality of tires and anything else that gets a lot of wear and tear. Um, and one of the things you know that we really specialize in is virgin resin in our tubing. Well, not only can we warranty it for 12 years, but that way when the mulch does move or the ground cover does move and it's exposed to UV or maybe it's rolled back up and you know kinked up in the back of a truck and then rolled back open again, uh, all these things going to lead to the to a longer lifespan of a product um, you know a lot of our tubing and our technology has been tested in ag for a long time so uh, when you go buy the cheapest tubing at the local distributor you're buying the cheapest tubing and there's a reason it costs a fraction of the cost of some of the higher end tubing types and um, you know we manufacture all this in Fresno and test it and uh, these are some popular questions that I was given a long time ago to ask and they might not seem relevant to us as contractors, but I can tell you if you've ever had a point source emitter pop out, a barb pop out, an insert fitting pop out because of the fluctuations in temperature. Uh, if you've ever had decolor, decolorizing in tubing, all these things are factors of inferior quality resin in the tubing. So think twice when you go out there to buy the cheapest, you could pay five to 10% more and potentially have a product that lasts three times as long. And then you just have to pass that that price onto your, or that cost onto your customer, and that should be an e easy upsell along with locking fittings. This is the right way to do it. So Michael, uh, we do have a question on this. Um, and it has to do with the lifespan of a drip tube or you know, supply tubing or emitter line. Uh, if it's properly installed, uh, what, what type of life should we expect to get out of it? Um, so if it's installed properly, I mean, I've had installations 15 to 20 years. It, a lot of it depends on, the maintenance company making sure that they're aware of where the drip products exist in a system and constantly making sure the ground cover is put over them. Uh, you know, the biggest, the biggest issue with drip irrigation systems is as soon as the tubing or the emitters become exposed, uh, they're at the mercy of people walking around, edging, um, you know, just the general maintenance wear and tear. So ideally, if they're installed, stapled properly, you'd be surprised how many people can't install a sta landscape staple properly. If installed properly, they should be tight to the ground. And if they have a decent amount of ground cover over and you know they're not put in drainage areas where rain could create these like canals that are gonna expose the tubing in the, um, the emitter line, it, it should easily last more than 10 years. Our tubing comes with a 12 year warranty and that's just against defects, um, you know, like environmental uh, conditions out in the field. If you were simply to put a roll of our tubing out there for 12 years, we're gonna tell you, you could use it in any of those times and it's gonna hold its form with fittings. Um, and you're going to pluck points or submitters in and they're going to pop when you put them in. They're not going to pull out if you, if you nudge them or bump into them. So, uh, but at the same time, you've probably seen islands or medians uh, where you can tell it's got installed and two years later, it's getting ripped up. Typically it's just because it's not stapled down properly and the, the right amount of care wasn't given into the ground cover, which is a huge uh, variable in protecting these things. 
Yeah, thank, thank you. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention too, here's a couple of uh, great photos on this slide that you actually took in our factory, correct? Yeah, yeah, the extrusion process of tubing is really fascinating. You know, we have to cool it off before we coil it or do this cable. So that you see on the bottom, we use um, an alkaline uh, induced water, you know, uh, canal that's about 60 feet long to cool it off. And then in the top one, you know, we, it's, it's a substantial amount of pressure that's used to create this heat. And if you look in the middle, that's actually the black tubing being pulled out. And so we heat it, all those um, devices in the background, sorry, my technical mechanical references are probably not accurate, but basically we're, we're creating a huge amount of pressure uh, that's heating up the, the resin little pellets and we're extruding it at a high temperature and then we rake it across this cold water uh, and then we coil it up. Yeah, and then we had another question here, Michael, about design margin, you know, looking at the capacity of a zone, how much do you over design, uh, you know, 10%, 20%, what, what do you over design to make sure that you uh, cover a zone adequately with irrigation? I do 20%. And the reason I do 20% on pop-ups and rotors, maybe not, a lot of time you don't have that kind of variance to work the thing with drip is you got to remember if, if if you if you maximize your design to 90 95 100 and you get something and it blows off because something gets ripped out you're losing a lot of water you're losing a lot of landscapes and potentially losing a lot of plants and so you want to minimize that risk so if you can work within the constraints of 75 percent 80 80 percent operating pressure that way if you do have something go wrong you don't have catastrophic failure um the same is i typically did on pop-ups and rotor zones as well i don't want to lose a rotor and then lose uh, a whole turf area um, and so that's what we're trying to do is minimize risk so it's not a it's not a heavy loss okay great thank you oh. all right um, so emitter line uh, I know we all know what emitter line is once again this is all virgin res resin emitter line you can see that brown tubing doesn't look like the dark matte colored round uh, middle line you're used to seeing. The reason for that, it's got a sheen to it. That's that's more than 95% virgin resin with a little bit of UD, UV additive in it. Um, that's the best emitter line you can buy. Uh, are you going to pay 5 to 10% more? Maybe, but between that and locking fittings, once again, these should be easy upsells to customers and this is the right way to do it. They've done tree rings in this installation for their grids. They, they've used poly on the ends or polyethylene supply tubing. Uh, this will be under four to six inches of ground cover and this landscape here in Del Mar, California is completely grown over. You would never even know this was in there. They've never had any issues and we're four, year, four to five years later into this um, application. Uh, I've mentioned on these bullets here, some popular emitter line variables that we pick out. Uh, you know, depending on the flow, you can go up to 20 millimeters. Maybe you're moving a lot of water further. So we need a little more water than a 17 millimeter line is gonna run. So we use 17, 18 and 20 millimeter. The lateral spacing is going to depend on plant types, like you can see in this application, you know, there's going to be a lot of ground cover in there between those bogies. And so we want that ground cover to get nice and thick. I think there was a blue, blue days of some sort that grew in there really nicely. So uh, that's why you see such tight lateral spacing there. And then the emitter spacing, this is what, you know, between the lateral and the emitter spacing, this is what controls our grid and how thick we want our plants to grow into each other. And then our emitter, our emitter flow is how fast we're going to apply water out of each one of those emitters. Depending on the soil type and the grade, we might not need to uh, apply water very quickly, so we're going to go with a lower flow emitter. Uh, so Michel Michel when, when we're talking about emitter line like this, we have this question about, uh, that wants to know your experience on subsurface drip irrigation, you know, how about placing the drip lines, how deep we go, air control, root intrusion, fertigation, kind of a, it's like the big summary question, you know, how, how does it all work? How does it work? And what, what's your experience? Yeah, so, so, um, so fertigation through emitter line it should not be an issue. I mean, if, if you're flushing and filtering properly, then any, um, you know, substrate or organic, uh, th organic compounds you're introducing to the line, uh, the bulk of them should be caught in the screen. You know, if you're fertigating through subsurface, you're going to want to maintenance your filter maybe a little bit more than not just because you are uh, putting particulates through it. But if you're flushing, a lot of that larger debris is going to leave the lines, and so it shouldn't be an issue. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for tape because there's not a physical emitter. Um, I'm sure, you know, the pros at our company can handle that. But with our emitter line uh, on the landscape side, we use a physical amnon emitter. So it's actually got a diaphragm in there very similar to a valve. And, you know, if you have a physical root barrier in there, when that system's done running, it's going to seal up. The majority of the time when you have root intrusion, it's because you got a very, very thirsty plant or turf area that is just thriving for water. 
And it, it's probably, it's usually because you're overwatering and you make get, create this very hungry, demanding plant type that goes looking for water more than it needs to. So if you're watering with a consistent schedule, you're not overwatering and you have a physical root barrier, you should not have any root intrusion issues. We've had drip line in the ground for more than 15, almost 20 years without root intrusion. Um, I know there's a lot of, uh, of magic tricks out there. Uh, people put uh, gold leaf and all these different you know, minerals in there. I don't necessarily think that's true. Uh, I think roots are gonna find their way regardless, but if you're watering properly, uh, you shouldn't ever have an issue with root intrusion. Uh, fertigation, root intrusion. What was the other question, Richard? Yeah, and uh, what about air relief? Yeah. And air relief, you know, the lines. Yeah, air, air relief, you definitely want to have on the end of each of your lines. I always use the metaphor, a tub of toothpaste. We're trying to push all the debris on the lines. If you've got a grid, you don't necessarily need to have an air relief on the end of every lateral line. But as long as you have one, you know, centered on the end of your, um, of your feeder line, that way when the system comes on opposite the valve, it pushes all the debris right out the air relief. That's going to help keep your emitters from being clogged. Clogged emitters, sometimes it'll hold the diaphragm open. That's when we'll get root intrusion. That's why flushing and filtering is so important. So that diaphragm inside the valve can open and close properly and not allow for any of those issues. And then what about the placing of the lines, Michael? Uh, how deep, how far apart? What are the variables there? I know that's a yeah. so as you saw, question, but. Yeah, so, um, so, one, so one of the issues, um, one of the huge challenges with drip uh, subsurface turf irrigation is uh, you know, it's great for irregular shapes and it's great for uh, complete sun exposure on turf. But a lot of turf areas, you know, if you've got the grass on the side of a house and then that same zone goes into the grass in the back of the house where you've got really direct sunlight, you've got to zone those out separately. Uh, shaded areas with subsurface and sunny areas with subsurface, remember all that water is staying in the soil at the root base. And so we want to make sure that the stuff in the shade isn't getting the same amount of water the, as the sun. And so we want to zone that out just like we would pop-ups and rotors. And you're not doing it for, for hydraulics, you're doing it because you want to know how much water you're applying. And as you saw in that photo, that's a direct sun area in Bakersfield or Fresno area. So it's going to get a lot of sun and there's, we know the sun exposure is consistent. So we know exactly how much water we need to apply. So we went with 12 inch spacing on our laterals because that's about the closest, maybe 12 to eight inches, any closer than that. You also got to look at your ROI. You're going to be spending a substantial amount of money on a middle line, um, and you need the customer to understand that they should only be spending 10 to 15 percent more than a typical pop-up zone to do this. If you're doubling the price of the products for a drip irrigation system, then you're doing something wrong. And so, what we want to do is we want to use 12-inch spacing in our emitters and about 12 inch to 18-inch spacing. On uh, but we do want to make sure that we get our roots nice and grown in before we switch over to the subsurface stuff. Great, thank you, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then so on the emission devices, uh, you know, if we're not using inline emitter line or sprinklers, yeah, what are here? here's some other manifold options that we can use. Uh, we call them point source emitters because they're, you know, applying, applying water right to, to the point of where we need it, the source. Um, flag emitters are a very simple take apart emitter for cleaning. Quadribubblers and octobubblers are exactly what they sound like they are for port and a port manifolds for, you know, more drought tolerant space. And then bubbler stakes are a, a good low cost way. Maybe you have a plant that needs a little more water when it's established and you want to adjust it down as time goes on because ultimately we are trying to reduce water as the landscape becomes more mature. Uh, all right, I see I'm going a little late here, Richard. Sorry about that. Um, on filtration, uh, so in landscape irrigation, we use a Y filter. I uh, really like this graphic. This is an ag, an ag style illustration. But as you'll see, the, the physics of it are the same. We're still ultimately trying to push water up into the, the screen basin until the system's done running. And then once the system's done running, we can either flush it out of the bottom of the Y filter, or as we do in landscape a lot of the time, we'll, um, we'll install our filter up, upright uh, for maintenance, which doesn't seem like it should work. But once again, if the debris is being pushed up into the Y filter, and then when the system's done running, it, the debris sits back down. The next time the system comes on, it should flush it out of the air relief at the end. A lot of times these are installed with no flush valves. Well, that's when you get the whistling because all that debris is being caught up in the basin and it's just dropping right back down once the system runs again. If you can, and as you usually see as the primary filter on a system, when they're above ground, as you saw in that ag illustration, they are pointing downwards as their design should be. Um, but I know a lot of times we don't have the footprint or the space to install them like that. And so we install upright and thus is what it looks like. 
Um, another, you know, disc filters are very popular with algae. They're easier to clean. If you've ever cleaned algae off of a screen filter, it's a nightmare. And so disc filters are great. They can be taken apart, opened up, and the little... You can let it dry in the sun, shake them off, or clean them off, uh, put them back together. But the main reason we use a screen a disc filter over a screen filter with algae and uh, organic growth is simply maintenance. It's easier. It doesn't ruin the valve, or excuse me, ruin the screen. Um, and uh, as far as flow attributes go, they have very similar flow att uh, attributions. So we could just uh, spec it and size it very similarly. Um, filtration, uh, th this is one, the CAD detail, we use CAD details as a lot of manufacturers do to show you how to properly install it. And this is a drawing that, uh, you know, spotlights are spring clean. Uh, flushing, uh, flushing to me is, is even more pop, is more of a priority than filter. I think if debris gets into your lines, it's not the end of the world if you have a flush valve on the end. A lot of my indoor growers, you know, on the cannabis side uh, are pumping a lot of organics and a lot of compost tea through their systems. Uh, you know, a flush valve on the end, this, this device does not cost a lot of money. It's an easy upsell. Uh, this combined with virgin resin tubing, power lock fitting, this is a proper way to spec out a uh, drip irrigation system. If you're going to the end customer and telling them all the reasons for this, hey, we're not going to lose plants to clogged emitters. Hey, we're eliminating any debris that's in the lines all the time. It's going to double, triple the life of your system. Do you want to have to redo the drip in four years or do you want to wait 12 years to redo it? These are some of the components that will help. Here's the difference in price, 10, 15% more. Uh, I don't know. I think I've got 100% close rate because I don't think anyone would ever turn down a better quality drip system. Usually if they're conscious enough to be installing drip and drought tolerant landscapes, they want it done properly. It's worth the upsell. If not, you can call us and we can be a third party voice of reason for you. And they usually go in a little bubbler box of pea gravel to try to distribute the water after the water comes out. This is a more simple version of it. We call it a tattletale. They'll go in little valve boxes as well and medians. If you've ever done a huge wet check on a bunch of, it's really hard to tell which zones are running. This little red indicator tattletale pops up so it works as a flush valve indicator combination. And just in case you're wondering how a flush valve works, when the system comes on and it's first introduced to water, Water runs in the system and it automatically opens up, pushes debris up, seals up, you're good to go. So now you've eliminated all the water, all the air and all the water out of the lines and uh, you know, you've reduced the risk of emitter, emitters clogging. And lastly, valve control. Um, you know, we, we deal with automated valves all the way from three quarter inch all the way up to 12 inch, 16 inches. Um, here's some larger hydraulic uh, ag agriculture valves. And then on the left, you see some, um, you know, glass filled nylon or poly valves that we used uh, on the landscape side, three quarter inch all the way up to two inch. Um, and once again, these can be used manually or they can be hooked to a controller for some automatic scheduling. All these things work together uh, to apply water right where we need it, which is at the root base. All right, I went 20 minutes over. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> That's okay. We had questions during, and uh, it was really valuable information. Great job, Michael. We do have a few more questions, too, and uh, absolutely are opening up to everybody to uh, add a question to the chat. Um, you know, when you were a contractor or when you see contractors out in the field uh, installing uh, drip, what are some of the common challenges you see that they're having and, and the solutions of those challenges? So the first one, as you saw in, um, in one of my first photos, is um, I, the trick of the trade that I use is I fill up my emitter line and my supply tubing with water before I lay it down in laterals. So as you'll see here, um, you know, any, any, regardless of the quality of tubing, you're going to get some kinking just because that's just how the, the plastic's going to work. But if you fill it with water, it adds some weight to the lines and it makes it really easy to lay out. Once you lay it out with some water weight in it, it allows you to staple it to the ground that much better. It's not trying to push itself up. And a lot of times I see people, first of all, when you install a landscape staple, you need to be squeezing it as you push it into the ground. It uses that mechanism of force to hold itself in, just like tweezers trying to open. If you just put a landscape staple in like a U, as soon as you walk away, it's gonna pop out. The ground's gonna push it out. So what you want to do is you want to really make sure that that the um, excuse me the emitter line and the supply tubing get close to the ground and they get stapled in really tight. If you do that, you're, it 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 will not come up nearly as much as it will if you allow for that airspace where people can trip over it and pull it up. That's one of the huge you know just very simple things that is overlooked, um, which leads to that ground cover movement, exposure of the tubing, 
As soon as that tubing is exposed, it becomes a trip hazard and it just tears everything up. So keeping it close to the ground, I think is, the, is one of the most important things. Yeah, great, thank you. So um, we've got an experienced uh, user here and they were asking, um, can we use different uh, con flow control devices in an octobubbler? Can we use a two, a 10 and a 20 within the same octobubbler? Yeah, so an octobubbler is a pressure compensating device, not a regulating device. And so what that means is there's a diaphragm inside the compensating manifold. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna make sure that the right amount of pressure is coming into that manifold. The flow devices that we're referencing, because there is eight different little flow devices in there, you can switch those out to whatever you want, but what you gotta keep an eye on is your flow. There's two variables in design. We have our pressure, which is the energy behind the mass. The mass is the water itself, which is our flow. So you may have plenty of pressure, which is usually what happens with my indoor growers. They have 60, 80 PSI. What you're doing is trying to push a little bit of water very quickly, and that doesn't make any of the devices happy. And so what you wanna do is if you're putting a 10 gallon, a two gallon, a four gallon uh, flow insert into an octobubbler, just make sure your total water flow, and you can put a five gallon bucket under your POC or your point of connection, and see, just time it. How fast does it take me to fill up a five gallon bucket? If it takes you 10 minutes to fill it up, well, then you know how much water you're getting per minute. You're not getting a lot of water per minute. If you can fill up five gallon bucket in one minute, you got five gallons per minute. If you're putting a man of, an octobubbler on there, remember a 10 gallon per hour flow control is by hour, not by minute. So you can usually put a lot of those on a single zone. Right, um, so, but within an octobubbler, right? <laughs> Or um, uh, can you do the, can you do a two gallon per hour, a 10 gallon per hour and 20 gallon per hour within the same one unit? Yes. Okay, all right, great, yeah, thank you. Um, another question here, um, if I'm installing a drip system, what can be my expected total life of the system? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, if installed properly uh, over 10 years, uh, uh, any, any system with components working together, there's going to be some maintenance. I mean, keeping an eye on your flush, your filter should be clean pretty regularly. Um, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times the upsell on these things is, is the end user ROI. If we're reducing your, cutting your water in half, we would hope that they displace that 50% of water or a fraction of it into the maintenance of your drip system. Your plants are going to thrive and, and that should be easy money for you to collect as a contractor. Uh, to maintenance, um, to maintenance the system. So there will be some, but but I would think ten years. I mean, you shouldn't re be replacing a emitter line or supply tubing or point source emitters, uh, you know, in three or four years. If you're doing it, either it's become exposed to the sun for prolonged amounts of time, it wasn't installed properly, or you're simply not filtering and flushing properly. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then we have another question about uh, compensating pressure compensating emitters and uh, and not pressure compensating. Um, does that change the usefulness or life of the uh, emitter line at all? No, it's just going to, uh, you know, it, it's going to go back to if you have 100 feet of, of you know, a 100 foot long straw and you start poking holes in it and you're blowing milkshake from the beginning as hard as you can, you're not going to have nearly as much milkshake coming out of the holes at the end of the straw as you are at the beginning. So if you had pressure compensating holes on there, same amount of milkshake regardless. So what we want to do is um, we want to make sure that the the, the landscape is getting the right amount of water consistently. Uh, it's not gonna change the lifespan as much as it is just gonna change inconsistencies, which is gonna lead to um, you know, plants being longer in the end than they're, or taller in the end than they are at the beginning. Um, and things of that nature, not to mention your run times and your water windows are gonna be all over the place uh, because you're constantly trying to compensate for too much water on the end and not enough at the beginning. Yeah, and then uh, you were mentioning that uh, maybe a drip system will be 10, 15, 20 percent uh, more expensive than a uh, traditional uh, spray head system. Um, using your experience as a contractor, what are some uh, tips or tricks you could share as far as uh, bidding a, a drip system? You know, some things that you learned that maybe uh, you, you didn't think of uh, initially when you first started. Yeah, so that, that variance in prices for subsurface turf irrigation. On, on a pop-up system or a rotor system, a rotor system is gonna probably, it's more than likely, I mean, they're not really apples to apples. You're not typically gonna use rotors on a, a drip area. But uh, the 10 to 15% increase I meant as opposed to installing 24 inch pop-ups, you know, with a streaming rotor nozzle, uh, a, regu a regulated head, all the, all the PVC, all the fittings, the trencher that you're gonna need to run it. All these things are gonna add up. But, um, you know, if you're putting, 
if you're putting the emitter line 12 inches apart across the same amount of square footage, you're obviously using more product for the same amount of area. Uh, the labor is going to not be as intense because you're not necessarily going to have to dig dishes, but you are going to be But once again, if you're cutting the amount of water, it should be an easy upsell. Um, some of the tips that I would give when I tell people is, um, you know, fortunately we've come a long way in drip irrigation. Most people are, are huge proponents of it now where they used to be a little bit more objective. Um, but typically the biggest argument we get from overhead is some people just like watching the water run. And if you don't care about watching the water run and you don't really think that your plants need a bath, um, then, you know, watering directly to the root source is the way to go. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, listen, I've got uh, about uh, 12.51 now, and uh, I'm seeing that, uh, uh, well, we've got one last question here that uh, I think you have an opinion on, and that is, what's your opinion of uh, rotating nozzles uh, as far as, uh, I'm guessing, as a water savings device and as well as uh, dependable? Yeah, so um, so anybody that's bought a streaming rotor nozzle, regardless of manufacturer, will, you'll always see the little screen at the base of it. One of the main reasons is that a lot of these have a, they, you know, um, I, I know one manufacturer that makes the MP, they have, they have over 23 moving parts inside that little rotating nozzle. It's just like a clock. As soon as you introduce dust or dirt into a clock, you're going to have issues with gears. And so the reason those filters exist the majority of the time is because they don't want any kind of debris going in there. Well, once you cr produce another, uh, you know, screen medium, that's one more thing to maintenance, one more thing to unclog. Um, so as long as you're filtering and flushing properly, even on a streaming rotor nozzle system, I, I think it's a great, uh, it's way better than a conventional nozzle with a very low DU rate. So um, you're applying water evenly, slower, you can get more heads on a zone. Uh, you know, the, the, the landscape the turf is thriving more. The one downside I see to streaming rotor nozzles or the application of the nozzles is people use them on a lot of drought tolerant plant spacings. And as a contractor, I'm always really confused because I don't want to water in between my plants. It just leads to weeding. And yes, you can put weed guard down, but now you're just watering weed guard. If you're watering ground cover, um, you know, and you have very consistent plant spacing and you're really trying to get a blanket of it, I think it's okay using a, a taller pop-up to get up above it. Um, but it's still just a, um, I don't really understand why you wouldn't use drip irrigation to water straight to the source. Um, you know, I just don't think that they have the same application. I think there's an application for both of them separately, but a lot of time I see people just want to switch out heads and put a, a streaming rotor nozzle on and collect the rebate, but you're not really doing the best for the landscape or the end user. Uh, it's just a little less labor intensive. Yeah. Well said, Michael. Thank you. And uh, again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. You know, uh, uh, trying times, uh, different times than any of us have ever faced before. But as we've said it before, we're all in this together, uh, making sure that our industry uh, uh, moves forward uh, in these trying times and that uh, everybody gets taken care of. So, uh, so thank you all for joining. And Michael, thanks very much. Great presentation. I know uh, we all got a lot out of it and uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, we'll be back on Friday with some uh, information about uh, control and uh, for valves and agriculture. And uh, we have some things lined up for uh, Wednesday and Friday of next week as well that uh, we'll be emailing out to all of you as well. So again, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate it. And I hope everybody has a great uh, rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, guys.